<clears throat> what's happening ward wrestling live uh wrestling nation what's happening out there uh we uh we uh we are we are welcome on to our program uh very honored to have coach tanner swell director of nova wrestling club and head coach at fairfax high school he's also a panel member at the nwca so he's highly involved in coaching up in that virginia dc maryland kind of area right that's right. right. Yep. The Deacon V, the other tri-state. <laughs> yeah. So, hey, man, first of all, welcome. It's an honor to finally get you on. I know you've been busy, uh, and, but we got you. So thanks. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Appreciate you having me on. <laughs> man, so first things first, obviously, the elephant in the room is this pandemic. Uh, it's causing, obviously, all sports to kind of struggle right now, but how has it how has it kind of affected your off season and what have you done with you know Nova wrestling club kids and Fairfax kids just to kind of keep their minds right keep them motivated and focused yeah obviously two two separate um you know organizations um you know the, the head wrestling coach at the high school and then of course I direct Nova so at Nova I only coach the uh, little hammers program which is the 4 to 7 year old program that uh, it's a pretty innovative little model that we use there to get kids into wrestling and how we introduce them to the sport. So I don't really do a lot of coaching at Nova, to be honest. I'm really, uh, you can call me the head custodian. You can call me the head fundraiser. You can call me, uh, you know, whatever. I make sure the lights stay on. I make sure, uh, you know, I drive the, I drive the ship really is what I do there. So someone uh, yeah, I, I you know, drive the ship and, and, uh, you know, in innovate in every way we can. And, and, you know, I'd love to obviously talk to you about that. But to your question, uh, you know, whenever the, the, the pandemic hit, obviously, I, personally, I just thought it was going to be a few weeks, uh, something like a month or something. So what we did at Fairfax was we put our kids on a, um, on a leadership program, um, uh, pro proactive coaching. It's an organization. And we went through and we created a – a group after the season called our culture keepers group. And at Fairfax, our, our motto, our, our mantra, if you will, is fight for the culture. Basically what that means in a nutshell is it means be your best self every day, you know, compete against yourself, you know, compete, be a better version of yourself today than you were yesterday. And if you do that, good things will happen. So, you, you know, you're not, if you're, if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. And if you're getting worse, you're not contributing to the program. So that's our motto, fight for the culture. We made a group called the Culture Keepers Group. And in that group, it's about, about 10 kids. And those are kind of what you would call our old reliables. Those are our kids that you know they're going to be doing the right thing. You can count on them, depend on them. If you're going into battle, you know they're going to be there and you know they're going to do what you're asked. They're not the most talented kids in the team. Some of them are, a couple of them are, ta are, are talented kids, but that's not what we look for when we created the group. We look for the kids who were all in the culture and not, we don't, you know, I think there's one thing we've done incredibly well at Fairfax is culture engineering, engineering a strong sound culture that goes beyond wrestling. And that's what I'm most proud of there. We've got a lot to do, a lot of things to do there. I mean, we're, we're just getting started. We've got a lot of, um, we haven't had the success that, 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 that we want to have. I mean, we're, we're going to get there. That's for sure. And our culture is going to take us there. So we've, we've taken leaps and bounds in the right direction in that regard. So anyways, we got a culture keepers group and we went through a seven day module on that. It's just super helpful, super beneficial. Um, and uh, so that was what we did with, with Fairfax and we've done weekly check-ins on zoom in terms of Nova, Nova, of course, 501c3. It's got 250 kids in the club. Kids from five years old or even you know, four years old, all the way to guys that are competing uh, at the US Open. And so it really, I mean, obviously it canceled our whole spring season. We did, uh, you know, virtual, we, we're still doing virtual training there. Um, I can tell you, we'll, we will be back on the mat this fall. Um, 
But I mean, it definitely, it definitely, I mean, fortunately from a club standpoint, I mean, it, it definitely hurts. I mean, you know, our benefactor banquet, we raised 85,000 to $100,000 at our benefactor banquet every spring. So we weren't able to have our benefactor banquet, which was, it didn't, you know, it's, it's not, our club is on very solid financial ground, but that's 85. <laughs> it doesn't help not to have the banquet. <laughs> yeah, that sucked. That was the biggest blow. And of course, <laughs> not being able to go to tournaments, not being able to go to summer camp, not being able to go to duels. I mean, it's definitely, definitely, it definitely changed definitely changed my life for sure. Typically I'm on the road every weekend during the spring and the summer. And I've just been, I've been you know, working my butt off with like side hustles and stuff. So it's been great. It's tough to, um, it's really tough to take anything for granted after this. Oh, I know, right? I mean, it's kind of one of those things where who would, have, who would ever guess, but um, yeah. So that's where we're at, but we, we're going to be back on the mat. I mean, we're going to be back on the mat September 1st, so. That's awesome. I, I feel like, uh, what's that Jim Carrey movie where he was like in a bubble the whole time? He just, every time he'd wake up, he'd walk to the same place, go work to the same place, come back home the same. Feels like the whole world has become that movie. <laughs> yeah, and frankly, everybody's got an opinion on it. And um, I, uh, again, like we were talking about in the pre-show, that serenity prayer, um, just in terms of having the ability and the strength and the, the, the poise to understand what's in your control, what's not in your control. And if it's not in your control, I mean, having a healthy locus of control obviously helps, but that's important right now. I think I tried to tell, like we were talking the other day and I said, you know, my, my wife would say, I don't understand how parents can right now, how it's, they just think it's okay to do that. Right. And I'm like, I get it. But remember that you know, we, we've come a long way in life and we're at a point where we're on one acre. We have a pool. There's a gym for the kids in the garage. There's plenty of outside for them to play in our, in our property. But think of, and I said, Last summer, our house flooded. Mm -hmm. So this is our second summer kind of facing some sort of distraction, right? But uh, last summer, going into last summer, our house flooded. So we had to move to you know, a little apartment for all four of us. So I asked her, I said, look, most families, your average family is living in that size or smaller with just as, as big of a family or bigger. So you've got to imagine that those parents and those kids are wanting to kill each other for a lack of better words, right? And at that point, they need to get them out doing something so they take the risk. And, um, and I think we may believe that too if we were in some sort of situation like that. We've just been blessed to be able to have a property where the kids can stay active and, and have something to do and be busy. So I definitely understand life situation is different for everybody. So um, some people handle it differently and I'm not for it or against it. I'm just, hey, if you can do it, do it. If you believe it's being done in the right way, then go get them. And if you think your club coach is doing the right things to keep your kids healthy, then have at it, you know? Um, just right now, my wife, she's in the medical field. So she kind of feels that for her, she's seen it hit home, and it's just not something she's caring cares to risk about, you know, or cares to worry about right now. So we stay home, and eventually she'll loosen up, and the world will loosen up, and there'll be processes and progress, and there'll be shots and needles and all that stuff, and maybe she'll she'll do a little better. But yeah, I mean, like you said, serenity, and you know, I don't know how I would think if I was in a one bedroom house with a family of five for whatever and we've been stuck for two months at some point you got to make a decision right yeah i mean i'll tell you one of the things that i am deeply concerned about 
and something I haven't seen. I know there was a presentation at the NWCA convention on this today, but it's something I'm deeply, deeply scared of right now is the long-term ramifications that the long-term ramifications on our sport, not with people who are already wrestling people. If someone's a wrestling family or they, their mom or their dad involved in the sport in some capacity, chances are there's little to no resistance in their kid wrestling. I'm talking about grassroots families that don't know anything about wrestling other than what they might have seen on TV other than what they remember from high school. And think about this for a second. If you went to high school, if these parents were in high school in like the early 90s, mid 90s, maybe even late 90s, think about what these parents associate wrestling with. Spitting in cups, plastics, people sweating everywhere. I mean, it's completely changed, right? And that is their initial frame for that. So then you bring into this COVID thing in the picture. Now you have another very serious obstacle that is going to have to, you know, we're going to, it's already challenging enough to recruit at a grassroots level. And I feel like, you know, it's something that the wrestling community needs to do a lot more of. Now we're going to have to figure out how to navigate this. And yeah, you're going to have to immediately address it when you're talking. I'm guessing your school, like other schools has the whole athletic meeting at the beginning of the school year where they invite the parents and the kids that are all athletes and you talk to them and you're trying to get other athletes to come into your sport and you're doing the whole pitch. But I'm, I'm thinking right there is when you're going to have to nip it in the bud. Like you're going to say, look, I know there's a, a fear of the touching and the switching and whatever it is that, that you see wrestlers doing, but I want you guys to know that this is what our process is going to be. You're going to show up. You're going to do this. You're going to do B. You're going to do C. We're going to, you know, we're going to care for your kids just like we would care for our own. So, yeah, I get it because parents are going to be like, I don't want my kid rolling in sweat of somebody else's. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's it's going to be a big obstacle. It won't be an obstacle for families that are already wrestling families. There's really no obstacles there for their kid getting It's going to be a non-wrestling person, right? Yeah, it's non-wrestling people. And frankly, that's what, you know, and I know you're probably going to circle to this later on, but that's something you don't hear a lot of. You, you know, I think as a sport right now, we're so incestuous in the sense that we just kind of stay within the kids that are already in the sport. If you think about what most clubs do, they try to, and I, this is a general statement, but it's largely true, identify and pick off the best kids in that region. And then that's how they try to build their club. How many clubs, truthfully, you could probably count on one hand in the United States that you know of, serious club professional coaches, that are actually going out and trying to develop grassroots kids who come from non-wrestling families. I can name a couple. And I haven't been in the, I haven't been in it. I've been in two years and one year in the club scene with my son. Um, I can only tell you what I see them do and and um, it seems like they have a really good culture there, but I can't speak for anyone else. I mean, I, I've talked to, you know, 40 club owners throughout the country or club coaches, um, but nobody's going to say, hey, uh, I'm the club owner that doesn't do that. You know, everything we talk about is obviously how to promote their club and promote the sport. <laughs> Nobody has come on yet and said, yeah, I don't look for your kid to be a new wrestler. I just look for the kid that's the top kid at high school. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's nobody's come on the show and said anything like that yet. But, I, you know, obviously <clears throat> in sports, recruiting happens and there are coaches out there. It's been really interesting for me because I tell you, and you're highly involved in the NWCA, and I'm doing the um, leadership course right now. And it's funny, as you're talking to me, 
it's it's like the show it's like the leadership course is talking to me because mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that you're saying that they're focusing on now as far as you know transitional coaching versus transactional coaching and growing from the grassroots and um not just focusing on your best wrestlers focusing on all wrestlers um you know not just you know keeping who you have in the room but going off and trying to find other people to fill those holes you know not filling a dual team is not good obviously because you can create more showcase for your school so a lot of really cool stuff i'm learning and and it's awesome talking to you because I, I can hear obviously you've been through it <laughs> you know to, just to clarify i want to add something to this i don't disagree with recruiting we'll do what i know about. I mean, active, but I'll tell you this, it's not our number one priority that we invest more, I would say, time, resources, attention. Well, we have, you know, different spectrum coaches on staff. We don't just have one guy. We've got like four paid professional coaches on staff at Nova, but it is a very high priority and uh, we do, it's, it's a huge priority for, for, the, for the club. So, I don't, but I, I don't disagree with recruiting at all. I, mean, I have personally don't believe there's anything wrong with it. Um, but I want to give an example is there was a kid, he wrestled for me at Fairfax. He graduated in 2000 in uh, 2018. He, no, 2019. He, he, uh, he started for two years, frankly. I mean, he, he was okay. He was an okay wrestler. Um, he's at Georgia Tech now for biomedical engineering. In 10 to 15 years, the guy's probably going to be a millionaire. Just yesterday, we're going to need a wrestling room at Fairfax. He wrote a check for 500 bucks to the club. And he's a sophomore in college. And uh, wow. You know, this kid wasn't never qualified for the state tournament, maybe finished fourth in the district tournament. I mean, great kid. It was exactly what we wanted. He was he was an academic valedictorian and things like that. But, you know, you think about what you were talking about with that NWCA point where they're really talking a lot about is, you know, think about this. This is just one example. But there's thousands of these across the country of these kids who aren't very good wrestlers and but get so much out of the sport that they're going to be the ones that are fueling the sport financially in 10 to 20 and 30 years you know and so if coaches are are transactional coaches like you were saying before where it's like you either win for me or you suck and i don't like you uh we're, then we're going to run that off and look what it's look what it would do to the future of the sport it's just run us into the ground we're already dying yeah. Right, like um, I think that if you talk to a, a successful coach like yourself and other people, um, the first thing they tell me is, obviously you're a coach and you're a wrestling coach, so you're kidding yourself if you don't want to win. All wrestling coaches want to win, right? I mean, you want to win. You're not going to have your job if you don't win, and people understand that. But if you're if your sole purpose is to win, then you're failing the kids because it shouldn't be. You talk to some of these really good coaches that are having kids come back, like you just mentioned, and they'll tell you it meant more to me to get that kid to college than to see him win a wrestling match. Or it meant more to me to see that kid graduate from college, become a doctor, whatever, than it, than it was to see him be a district champ or a regional champ. That This was just a, a means to the end. Yeah, I think. I that makes sense there. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, to me, I think it's if you, if someone's doing it right and they're a transformational coach, then it all goes hand in hand. You know, it's right. all intertwined. It's not one or the other. It's if I mean personally, I think transformational coaches get the most out of their athletes and put themselves in the best position to win. Transformational coaches are going to heavily and very deliberately invest in winning processes. Um, transactional coaches are not. I mean, and frankly, in this day and age, 
just to, in, 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 you know, you know this, you have a kit. I don't, I don't have a kit, but I can tell you this, in this, this are this current generation of kids. There's nothing wrong with them, by the way. You will never hear me complain or say, oh, this generation's a kid is soft. They're this, they're that. No, you know what? No. And, and, and if they are, whose fault is that? It's not their fault. So my, my take on this is that with this generation of kid is different. If we coach this generation like we were coached, even up to 2000, 2005, 6, 7, even 8, 9, 10. But think about like if we coach these kids like we were like, like, you know, you see kids like people were coached in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, they'll quit in heartbeat. And so I remember, I remember sitting on a basketball bench and my basketball coach, his eyes were cross eyed. He was yelling at me so bad. I wanted to go just. I was getting just humiliated in front of everybody. I couldn't imagine that happening today. Uh, I mean, it would, it, it, it would, and that's a transactional approach. The kid's not going to respect you. They're definitely not going to wrestle for you. Wrestling's already hard enough. And this is kind of where, you know, when I was talking about the 3D coaching um, program, I think 3D coaching is going to play a huge role in saving the sport because it's going to train our coaches to be transformational coaches and to coach the 21st century athlete. And it's look, technique is not, I mean, technique's great. You gotta have good technique to win. You gotta have really good technique to win to be the best. You have really good technique, but let's be completely honest. It's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. It's really not. It, it let's be clear. It's not, there's a lot of people that can teach really good technique. How many people can be, how many people are a three-dimensional coach truly and can coach kids hard and get the most out of them? Not many. So explain to us what 3D coaching is, coach. So the 3D coaching uh, model, it's something that uh, Mike Clayton and, and God bless him, Mike Clayton at USA Wrestling, in my opinion, is one of the most innovative minds in the sport right now. And he is one of the, one of the hardest workers in the sport. He's got one of the biggest hearts for the sport. I, uh, I have the utmost respect for Mike Clayton at USA Wrestling, and he's the director for a coach's education for Colorado Spring. And uh, thankfully, he's really good at what he does. And he is the one that's really introducing and injecting the 3D model, I'll get to it in a second, into the wrestling community. Now to get your silver certification through USA Wrestling, you've got to take the uh, you've got to take the, the, the 3D coaches course. Long and short of it is what the 3D coaches course does is it teaches you how to coach a 21st century athlete by, you know, addressing three things like skills, right? Which is kind of your first dimension. Your second dimension would be your mind. So it'd be like the psychology, right? Um, and then the third is the heart and that's the hardest one to coach. And what it says is, look, you know, you might get, you got to be able to coach the sport. You got to be able to co coach the skills. You got to be able to teach the skills or you're not going to have any, no one's going to respect. I mean, you're just not going to have any respect, right? You got to learn. You got to know how to coach wrestling. So talk about that, then, then the mind and then the heart, but it talks about to really, um, you know, and again, it talks a lot about the transformational transactional piece, transactional being that you do this and I will like you. You win, I will like you. You lose, I will crap on you. Whereas a transformational coach is showing uh, that he or she values the athlete for who they are intrinsically. You know, I love you because you are the athlete not because of what you do or you don't do. And it's not a, it's not a soft approach. I think a lot of people, especially your old school guys, look at this and they say, and they don't have a growth mindset anyway, so they're not going anywhere. And when I hear people say this, I'm like, you know what? I, it, 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 it breaks my heart, frankly, when, when people don't see the, when, when people aren't willing to grow in this regard. But some people look at it and they say, oh, that's really soft. You know, that's just, you, you, have, you have kid gloves on. You know, and you're not being tough. You're not toughing them up. It has nothing to do with that. You could be an incredibly demanding, 
very tough coach and be a three-dimensional coach. And I would take a three-dimensional coach any day of the week over someone, even over like a four-time freaking NCAA national champion uh, who's transactional. I'll take the 3D guy all day long. Yeah, and I don't think that you have to be – you can still have moments where you have to yell at a kid. You can still have moments where you have high demand for the kid. You can still discipline a kid. But if that kid loses, you're still right there saying, hey, you didn't lose, you learned. Here's what you did. Here's what we need to do to grow. Don't worry about it. Come on, let's get better, right? As opposed to I'm yelling at you, I'm demanding of you, and then you lost, and I hate you. I don't even want to talk to you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you this anecdotally, uh, having come up in the sport wrestling from a, a super early age, my dad was a, was a high school, he was a very successful high school coach. Um, and he did not know how to coach youth kids, and especially in our area, in Wilmington, North Carolina, there was there was no wrestling. Wrestling did not exist. So this was a big experiment. Um, but, you know, having come up in the sport and having seen the kids who came out and did really well, seeing how they were coached, seeing especially how their parents interacted with them. Um, and I'll, I'll use George Hickman and Frank Hickman as examples. And, uh, George was a two-time qualifier at Bloomsburg. Frank was a three-time round of 12 at uh, Bloomsburg. Both North Carolina kids, very, some of those successful North Carolina wrestlers in the history of the state, very good. Both of them are, are professional MMA wrestling coaches out there. They coach uh, Volkanovski out of, out of Sonia, Peter Yan, um, uh, Shimchenko. I mean, they're coaching the highest. I mean, they've got like four – UFC champs that they're coaching right now, that they're in their corner. And I think about the contrast of how their dad interacted with them, say, versus how my dad and, and I saw some of the other dads interact with their kids. And their dad was always in the bleachers. He was always, whatever you need, he was always there. He was always present. He was always supportive. He made sure that they had whatever they needed you know, match day. I never one time saw, uh, you know, saw their dad chew them out or like freaking crap on them or anything. I mean, he was just always there. Just always gave him a hug and it was always their experience. And I think about his name's Bruce Hickman is, 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 uh, is the dad's name. And I'm like, this guy like perfected the dad wrestling model. Um, you know, and my dad didn't know any better, honestly. It's not like my dad was deliberately making a mistake. He just had no idea how to, how to, coach, how to coach his own kid. Um, you know, and he eventually, I think, started to figure it out. But not to get on a rabbit hole there, but I, yeah, I, a lot of those things kind of, you know, come to mind. And, and I, one of the, the things that I'm very interested in and, and have a lot of strong opinions on is, is the role of parents in the sport. Um, that's something that I've, I've thought a lot about and it's very personal. It's a very personal topic um, that, that hits close to home, but a lot of it, it like, you know, what I'm saying is, is so intertwined with that transactional versus transformational. Yeah. I think um, I've learned a lot being a wrestler's parent. Now I've learned a lot on, <clears throat> I've made mistakes. I've lost my temper and yelled it's a pin or, I've, I've, um, you know, or, or maybe I, I had expectations that I shouldn't have had at, at some point, but I've always tried to, I've always just tried to ask, you know, just one question, whether he wins or loses or whether he goes to a club and, and practice and has a tough practice. I, I always just try to ask him, are you having fun? Was it fun? Yes or no, whatever. But I just, I always want to make sure that that's what's important to me. I like, sure. Yeah. It sucks as a parent when I saw my kid lose 30 straight before he won the first one, you know? Yeah. That sucks to see the pain, to see the growth, to see the whatever. But, but I always still used to ask, are you having fun? <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, have I, 
yelled at him? Have I done this? Yeah, but I've learned a lot of new questions to ask through this platform. I've learned how to be a little bit better coaching wise. I've taken two like coaching courses. I'm taking a leadership one now and I, I got bronze certified for whatever reason I did it. And um, that's taught me a lot. I've learned a lot about, you know, ask, don't tell. And I, you know, when, when, when he's going up against somebody that is, you know, state ranked and where his mind might think, oh my God, I, I need to be better at saying, hey, it's not a big deal. Just go practice your single legs or practice your underhooks or whatever. Just go out there and practice something. So it takes your mind away from who you, you know, just little things I've learned. But yeah, I've made the mistakes where my <laughs> coach Rose had to be like, Dan, dad, go back to the stands. <laughs> I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I, I, I've, thought, I've thought a lot. I've obviously thought a lot about this, but one of the best conversations I ever had on this uh, was with Izzy Martinez. Uh, at Illinois, and uh, an incredibly nice guy. I mean, the guy answered every question. Super, super good dude. And um, I asked him this question straight up. You know, he said, "He said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm very direct, deliberate, and tough on my wrestling dads because I care about the relationship with their son. The minute that." that relationship is broken or, or impacted negatively because of wrestling, it's a, it's a tragedy. If that kid and that dad can't sit down at dinner and have a family dinner after wrestling practice or a competition, it's tragic. So he said, I don't do it. I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't, lay down these rules and expectations with my wrestling parents because I'm like trying to, because it's an ego thing or because I'm, or because I, I, because it makes me feel good or because I enjoy it. He said, because my dads need to be dads because their kid needs a dad. And if that dad gets so consumed and becomes transactional, I'm doing all this for you. I'm doing for you every weekend. I'm spending, you know, I'm sacrificing. I haven't got a new pair of shoes in three years. And you go out there and you don't even give it 100%. That kind of stuff. And it impacts the relationship with his son. So he said, because, because I know that my wrestlers need dads. And that dad needs the son. So he was like, I see myself in there protecting that relationship. And of course, I think you have some dads that will come out and say, look, this is a unique situation. I don't need your advice. This is my relationship with my son, and I'm going to do exactly what I want. And uh, is that right? Well, I, I think the best thing I was told early <laughs> on, I, you know, when my son first started, he was 12, he's 14 now, and I would be. I'd yell at the stay. I'd never done this before. I'd never been a kid, an athlete's parent before, right? So I was screaming from the stands. I would come down and be like, come on. And I, I think I got a little too involved and I didn't know better. And Coach Rose, after a match, he came and said, Dad, I get it. I, I, I'm a dad too. I, I coached my kids when they were younger. And I know it's going to be difficult for you, but you really need to separate yourself. Um, you need to really work on separating yourself. Let, let him be him, let him grow into the sport. He'll get there. But you yelling and him hearing you, you're just kind of embarrassing him. You're just, it's not, it's not helping. So I understood it. And um, I really worked to, I've really worked to be better. I stay up at the stand sometimes. You may hear me scream still cheering, nothing bad, nothing profane. I yell and scream and cheer. Um, but I've gotten a hundred percent better than I was. I, you know, I never want to be that parent that that thinks he knows more than the coach because I'll never be that parent. Whether I, <laughs> so I, I'm definitely learning. And my son has taught me. So you know, the first time I went off to a camp or a tournament with him, and he'd get done wrestling, and I'd be right there. Yeah, you okay? Man? Finally, he was like dude, you got to give me fucking 10 minutes. Like, just give me 10 minutes. Like, stop running after me as soon as I'm done. Yeah. I don't want to talk 
you, right? So I've been coached by him too. And, uh, and it was good to hear his feeling because that helps me understand where he's at. So I'm adjusting. You know, one of the things just to, when I think about this a lot, it sounds like you've been, you and your, your family have been very blessed with this and some families are very blessed with it and some unfortunately aren't. But I think so much of this is contingent on having and finding a good coach, you know, and, and the, the parents, as you have done, being very, very, um, yeah, just finding a good coach, right? To be able to say, I trust you. If the parent can't do that, then maybe I don't, I, I, I don't blame them for getting involved like that. And I've never had, I've never had like Coach Rose or Coach Palazzo at the club or at the high school at that he goes to two separate places. Ever, you know, sometimes you've heard of like the high school coach wants you only to learn it his way and nobody else's way. Don't go to someone else's club. Come to me or the club guy, whatever, whatever that, that I'm learning. But not once. Um, he was like very welcoming to the club. He's been helping Daniel out. He's been doing great. And then when he first entered the club, Coach Rose said, hey, just keep me in the loop on what he's learning so I kind of understand the direction. So when I get him back in the room, we can build on that instead of trying to be just trying to start teaching him something else and just taking him right away from that. Let's build on what he's learned. So it's been very, very good to have that because there's, there's never been any kind of like, no, his way is not the right way. No, don't do it his way. It's always been, you know, let's just grow the kid and what he's good at together, you know, and it's been, it's been awesome. That's super cool. Yep. But mm. um, I know uh, we've been, we've been, uh, we've been going and going. Um, and I think, <laughs> I think I asked you the one question, you went right through everything. You talked about developing the youth. You talked about non-wrestling people. You've talked about the longevity of the sport with the whole, um, you know, making sure that that we go after these non-wrestling parents and make sure that we, they know their kids are safe. Talk about 3D coaching, uh, developing professional coaches, transactional. Um, I don't know if we touched on this, wrestling as a vehicle for upward mobility. I think that's one thing that I know that maybe, I think you've gotten through everything else here. Yeah, I, um, I mean, personally believe this. I think you would believe this too. I think most wrestling people would believe this. But I think that this is the, when I say wrestling is the best vehicle to upward mobility, what I mean by that is regardless of a kid's socioeconomic status, whether they're very well off, they're dirt poor, wrestling will, is the best opportunity, the best vehicle to get them from point A, where they are, to where they want to go. And uh, one statistic that backs that up is the fact that right now wrestling has the most first-generation college students in, in CAA. Um, and, you know, that, that's a great stat. And I think about this. I, you know, I, I, I think about how do we sell wrestling to non-wrestling people that we were talking about before. Not only in terms of selling it to parents to get their kids in the sport, but like, how do we sell it to a community? Like let's say here in Northern Virginia, uh, there's a lot of people that are very well and they have a lot of income that they need to, to write off for charitable donations. How do I approach this person and say, we, you need to invest your money into Nova Wrestling Club. Well, why wrestling? Why put it into wrestling and not the local football club or the baseball club, some other little you know, sports club? Why wrestling? And uh, you know, how do we sell the sport? And I think, frankly, this is the, 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 the crux of that sell, which is that if you really want to create community and generational change, and by generational change, I mean... You take a kid who statistically shouldn't be going to college and they get to college because of wrestling, that's going to change the whole 
change the whole game. Changes everything. A short little anecdote there is, I had a kid that, that wrestled for me. He's at the United States Merchant Marine Academy right now. He's a 197 pounder there. He, uh, he's actually shipping out to the Middle East uh, uh, in a couple of weeks. You know, his mom moved from county to Fairfax his eighth grade year. No one in the family had been to college. And he's going to the United States Merchant Marine Academy now. He'll graduate. And when he graduates, he'll go into the Merchant Marines. And he'll make $15,000 a month. Change it. He's got a little brother with Down syndrome. Uh, he's got a sweet little sister. And uh, his, he's set. He'll be able to take care of his family. He'll be able to do everything for the rest of his life. And wrestling got him there. He'll tell you, to your face, wrestling got him there. So my point is that if people really want to create generational and community change, wrestling's the way to do it. And uh, so we've been able to very successfully sell that to our community here in Virginia. People have been very kind and generous and, and, and trusting that when they give us their money, what they're going to do with it. And we have. Um, one of the things that we've done is marry uh, academic enrichment and wrestling together. Last year, we built out a, a $70,000 athlete enrichment center. It's got six computers, a printer, internet. Pro, it's got tutoring in there three days a week. Kids can go in there and get free tutoring. Um, and so we've been able to marry these two things together where kids can get advised on their post-secondary um, placement opportunities and all that. And, I mean, really anything under the sun. And so we found that when you do it right, you can really, you can really sell non-wrestling people. I would say 75% of our donor base are non-wrestling people. Um, people that have never wrestled in their life. Maybe they did a little bit, but most of them aren't. Or they don't have a kid in the sport. So that's what I mean by that. And, and of course, I think whenever we understand it from that platform, um, it's a great way to, to, to recruit at a grassroots level with parents and, of course, just all around. I mean, it's just, again, seeing it, seeing the sport in a transformative way and not a transactional way. So, yeah, um, definitely, um, definitely been amazing for me to watch my kid grow and, and see the kids that I've gotten to meet grow and then talk to wrestlers and coaches like yourself that are out there in the sport that'll tell you um, I wouldn't be here without it. So it's been um, definitely cool. And first generation wrestler guys, like I had NATO on earlier, nobody in his family wrestled, but, but him and he found it and look what it's doing for him. Right. Um, so pretty cool. I had a young kid, Elijah Verona on a two time state Florida champ. He said, man, my grades sucked. And then wrestling, I was like, shoot, I better get my grades up because I really like this. And it helped me get the discipline and the understanding to, if you if you want to do both, you really got to learn how to be, be both, I guess is the best way to say it. But pretty cool, man. Well, yeah, hey, well said, man. I think we can go for hours. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I'm going to get to my 10 questions. You ready? Let's do it. All right. Freddy's or five guys? Five guys. Uh, you got one day to train. Do you go to a rumble or a clinic? Oh, clinic. MOD or little Italian pizza? Little Italian pizza. Clubs or camps? Clubs. Coyote Grill or Anita's? Coyote Grill. Small business, wrestling supporter. Nice. Awesome. Uh, 32 or Fargo? 32 all day. <laughs> Not a fan of Fargo at all, man. Not <laughs> overrated. Overrated. 32. <laughs> awesome. Glory days or wing zone? Glory days, small business, wrestling supporters. Shout out to Glory days. Uh, freestyle or Greco? Freestyle. Greco's <laughs> weird, man. Greco's weird. I'll say it. I'll say it on here. Greco's weird. You guys are weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Fago de Chao or Texas de Brazil? Texas de, ah, uh, yeah, Texas de Brazil. Great place, fair or small. Yeah, we have one down here and uh, at the end of, not this season, because at the end of this season, this happened, but at the end of last season, I took Daniel there to Chow because he didn't have to cut anymore. So it there was like go. his end of the uh, National duels or Disney duels? National duels. Cool. Well, man, that's all I got. I mean, I guess we could keep going, but probably both got to go. But, man, well, keep kicking life's ass, man. I, that's what I say to everyone. And I tell people, you got a new fan here. I, I'm, I'm just honored you came on. It, it was really cool. What a, what a real dope conversation we had and really got into a lot of cool stuff there. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, and um, I can't wait to get out of here so I can travel around and get to meet everybody. Yeah, well, God bless you, man. And hey, thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for, you know, setting the example of having a growth mindset and, and learning and like soaking it up. It's inspiring. It's encouraging. And I, I wish everyone had that mentality. And uh, thank you for, for giving back and using this as a tool to, to create, uh, you know, share stories and narratives there's a lot of value in that there's a lot of value in narrative and story and so thank you for getting that out there yeah uh, thanks for the kind words the support uh brian thompson just said tanner's the man <laughs> Brian's a good dude. <laughs> yeah but it's been fun like i tell people I, I can't wait you know of course eventually wrestling will be back and eventually i'll get to be in a gym again and watch kids wrestle and i can't wait to do it through my new eyes you know like yeah. I'll, I'll understand more about oh that's why they did that oh i understand that now or okay dan that's one of your uh emotional triggers go go to the stands right now <laughs> yeah like I'm, I'm learning right so yeah baby steps yeah man i uh you know i uh i started uh meditating a lot last year uh, it helps me out a lot do a lot of, I'm kind of a little hippie in that regard, man. Do a lot of yoga, do a lot of meditation, a lot of prayer. You know, I'm like a yeah, real spiritual guy. So I, yeah, I just um, you know, I used to be able to throw Daniel around, but now he's 14, but he's taller than me, bigger than me, stronger than me. I'm like, I try to get that old man strength on him every once in a while, but he he does like one of those move out of the ways, and I go flying. So. <laughs> Well, hey, you can always tell him this. He's always got to go to sleep. He's always got to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. I tell him I got a Louisville slugger. You better be careful. <laughs> I can't say that in the world today. I'm going to have somebody hitting up the show like, he beats his kid with a Louisville slugger. <laughs> no, I don't beat him with a Louisville slugger all the time. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, brother. Hey, take it easy, man. Hey, man, cheers.